So the very first word out of Jesus' mouth in his very first sermon is the word blessed. That starts out his ministry of what he wants to extend into this world is God's blessing, God's presence in this world. And he invites the disciples into this ministry, into this mission of extending God's presence and God's blessing into this world. And we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, are then invited into that mission of blessing as well. Through the Holy Spirit, we are an extension of Jesus' hands who bring that, that brings this blessing into this world. We have been talking about the Holy Spirit and the God the Father and God the Son. We've been talking about the Trinity as we've been working through our series on the Creed. And so we've been unpacking what do we believe when we say we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Taylor started talking about the work of the Holy Spirit last week, and I'm going to continue to unpack that even more. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. We say these words often when we have baptisms here in church. It reminds us of who this God is that we believe in, how this God comes to us. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Catholic Church. I believe in the communion of saints. I really do. I've seen the Holy Spirit show up when people reach out to one another in kind gestures and ways to care for each other that not only are the kind gesture itself, but also conveys this very presence of God. I've seen it happen in many places and I've seen it in my own life as well. And there was one stretch of time in my life where I experienced the extension of kind gestures and actions towards me that were more than just those kind gestures and actions, but they helped me experience the presence of God. I think it even saved my life, or at least saved my sanity. This was the time right after our daughter was born, almost 13 years ago, and the day she was born, we discovered that she had a very serious heart defect. And she was taken from us and put in the NICU, and she had open heart surgery when she was five days old. And we spent those early weeks of her life staying with her in the hospital. And we lived in Chicago at the time, and people were reaching out to us when they found out about our daughter's condition. And people who I think represented the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, surrounded us through calling us, emailing, sending cards. Those friends of ours who were in Chicago provided meals for us, cared for our family members who had come in from out of town. People were praying for us, people that I'd been connected to through church, through small groups, Bible studies, Bible camp, people I went to school with, were reaching out in Christian love and were not only giving me kind words and gestures, but I felt the Holy Spirit present in these interactions with all these people, and it helped sustain us through this time. I felt like there was just so much that we were separated from when we were in the hospital, but we didn't feel separated from God because of what people were sending into our lives. And in those early weeks, I couldn't hold my daughter, and so I was trying to find some way to feel connected to her and the only thing I could think to do was to sing to her, to sing to her the songs of faith that I had learned growing up in the Holy Catholic Church, in the community, communion of saints. So I sang to her song after song. I knew a whole bunch of first verses of hymns, and I could just sing all day long to establish that connection somehow. And once we got out of the hospital and we spent a long winter in our apartment, not letting very many people come over because we had this like germ-free environment and we didn't want to compromise her immune system and anyone who penetrated our fortress of sanitation had to wash their hands and sing the ABC song and then follow with hand sanitizer. But those visits, even though they were rare, were sacred. They were holy. Those people who came into our lives brought with, them, brought with them the presence of God. They were the communion of saints for us. And it's hard being a parent of a newborn anyway because you don't know what's normal. 
And so I was nervous, I was anxious all the time, I was freaking out, I was wondering what's normal, what's not normal, and I was given words of wisdom from other wise people who would help sustain me. As I was asking like, is this sleep pattern normal or is this connected to our daughter's heart condition? Is what, is she eating enough? Is it normal is it, or is it connected to her heart condition? Is what's coming out on the other end normal or is it related to our heart, her heart condition? So instead of just the regular heightened worries of being a regular parent and being crazy and sleep deprived, I was also wondering what are watch signs we need to be looking out for connected to her heart condition. But the people who brought peace, the, be the people who brought meals, the people who brought all sorts of things into our lives helped sustain us through that time as well. I've seen the Holy Spirit showing up in many different ways before then and since then, but that was the first stretch of time where I really connected the actions to the work of the Holy Spirit, and I saw them coming together. And those actions and those words and that peace and that presence stayed with us even through her short life of she died before she reached her second birthday. But it's carried us even since then. And since then, now I am even more aware when I see other people hurting and I see others reaching out to them and how the Spirit can be brought into people's lives, the very presence of God can be brought into their lives when they're in a time of anxiety or desperation or on the edge of sanity, I've seen how the Holy Spirit can work. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. I believe in the communion of saints. Adam Hamilton has this to say about the Holy Spirit. He says, the church is the gathering of people called out by Jesus, who belong to Jesus and therefore who seek not only to experience fellowship with him, but to do his will and his work in the world. That's what we're called to be as the church. I believe these things. Now let's look at the words of the Apostles' Creed that we say, oh, one back. Yes. I think we can make these words smaller than they are meant to be. I think we can just say these words as something we've maybe memorized at some point or we hear every once in a while in church. But these words are big. When we say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, it's more than just words. Our teaching series has been called the creed, what and why, the things we believe. But I'm interested in the how. Like how these are more than words, how we can live what these are supposed to imply. The word holy, it doesn't mean that the church is made up of a bunch of holier-than-thou people. It means that the church is made up of a bunch of regular people, you and me, and yet God has given us a holy purpose. The word holy means set, set aside for a purpose. So God gathers up us ragtag people and gives us a holy purpose, a mission, this mission of extending God's presence, God's peace, God's blessing into the world. That's what it means to be a part of the Holy Catholic Church. The word Catholic, I think this is the word that people ask me about the most. Because they'll say, I thought this was a Lutheran church. Why do we say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church? Or some people will say, I'm not really into denominations. I don't know why we have to focus on anyone, and even Lutheran or Catholic. I just want to follow Jesus. Well, the reason we use this word Catholic, not capitalized, is because it comes from a Greek word, kataholos, which means all throughout, as far as can be, universal. So it's trying to paint this picture of anyone anywhere on this earth who are followers of Jesus are connected in this Catholic Church, of which Lutherans and Roman Catholics and all the other Christian groups are included. That's why we say Catholic Church. And then when even we look at the word church itself, we can just boil it down often to meaning the building that we go to to worship. The word church we actually get from two different words from both Greek and Latin. In Greek, it's ekklesia, and that word means people who are called out for a purpose. 
And the word in Latin, curiacone, means people who belong to the Lord. So we're at the same time called out to go out and share this message, and we're also belonging to the Lord. So we've got this scattered yet uniting call as the church to be the church. And then we have this word, the communion of saints. And yes, we just got to share in holy communion together, and that's one place where we experience God. But the word communion also means this quality of the connection we're meant to cultivate here this depth of relationship where we can be real, we can be honest, we can practice forgiveness and understanding and caring and compassion in this place and extend that beyond this place. That's what communion is. And when it's the communion of saints, it's not just all of us, this ragtag group, people made up of saints and sinners. Saints also includes those who have passed away and those who are not yet born. It's this extension of God that unites all people from every time, every place in this body of saints. And we who are alive right now, we're the, when we say we're sinner and saints, it means we're the people God isn't finished working on yet. So God's still working on all of us here in this place. That's a whole lot of concepts. When we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, it extends through time, it extends through space, and it shows up in concrete acts of care and compassion and unity and community that we create together. That's a powerful thing. When we say these words, I think we could also include, I believe in the power of showing up, showing up for one another, to be that presence of God for one another. I believe in the power of our words and our actions to convey the presence of God. I believe in the power of the rituals that we participate in together so that we can all meet God in one time and one place together. I believe in what the church is supposed to be and what it sometimes is. Because this isn't a perfect place and we don't always live up to this high calling God has for us. But yet, even through all of our failures and stumbling, I see the presence of God being worked out in this place. I see people reaching out. I see the Spirit still working on us. And that brings us to Jesus' words, these words of blessing that Jesus extends to people. I think we also make this word blessing and blessed small, smaller than it is. We'll say, I'm so blessed I got a sweet parking spot right out in front of the church. Or, I'm so blessed my March Madness bracket is still crushing it. It's not, mine isn't. Maybe somebody else's is. But I think what Jesus is trying to convey is something much bigger than that. Because our blessings don't depend on our circumstances, if things are going well for us or not. So Jesus extends blessing to people who are struggling, people who are hurting, people who are often overlooked or not included or trying to do the right thing but not getting recognition. Jesus extends that blessing to people who are maybe just on the edge of sanity. And he asks his disciples to extend the blessing too. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now the poor in spirit may be people who are just kind of numb. Maybe they're people who have turned off all their feelings because they've been told that they're not valued or they are not welcome. Jesus extends blessing to them. Jesus extends blessing to people who are hurting, who are mourning. Jesus extends blessing to the meek. I think we often can equate meek with weak, but it's not. Meekness means restrained strength. Like you could hit back, you could go low, but you don't. It's an attitude of humility. Then Jesus also gives a blessing to people who fight for a just cause. He says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who have a fire in the belly. Often, people who have that fire in the belly aren't getting recognized. They're working hard, but it's an uphill slog. You don't often get recognized for doing the right thing and being consistent and doing the good thing and the going out of your way to care for others thing. It's hard work. So Jesus offers a blessing. Then Jesus gives a blessing to the merciful. 
And merciful, that seems like a good word, but the only time mercy is necessary is when someone has done something wrong, when someone has, has broken a trust or done something that hurt others, and instead of greeting them with judgment, you greet them with mercy. It's hard to extend mercy to people. So Jesus gives a blessing to the merciful, a blessing to the pure in heart, a blessing to the peacemakers who stand in the middle of conflict or violence and cast a new vision. Jesus gives a blessing to those who are persecuted for following him. I think the last one is one that most all of us who grow up in the United States will never understand or ever taste. Because we can freely worship our God in this country. We have a country with a lot of diversity and other faiths, but no one is preventing us from worshiping our God. There are people in places in Africa, places in the Middle East, throughout Asia, who cannot worship God without threat of torture or punishment or death. So that's one that we can't even relate to. So Jesus gives a blessing to those people as well, because their circumstances are very hard. We are invited into this mission too. This mission of being the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, of extending our hands in blessing through the Holy Spirit having our hands be an extension of Jesus' hand that reaches out with blessing. That's our call. Adam Hamilton also says this, the church is holy when those who consider the church home don't ask, what do we want our church to do for us? But rather, what does God want his church to do for him? We belong to the Lord. We've been called into this great mission. Where does God want us to go? How is God calling us? How can we be reaching out beyond ourselves? How can we experience the fullness of God so much in this place that it busts out, that it pushes us out to care for people who are hurting, who are struggling, who are maybe right on the edge of sanity? And that our actions, our gestures, our words, our acts of service to them could convey the very presence of God to them. That's powerful. I think as we close this sermon, I'd love it if we all could confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Can we find the creed up here? Yes. Say it with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.